So as I said, Deborah won't be here with us today, but I want to introduce you to our keynote speaker, Catherine Waldron, who is the COO of the National Healthcare Informatics Sharing and Analysis Center. Um, and uh, she will be uh, speaking with us today. She, in her past, was also a VP of Sprint and has uh, uh, over 25 years of telecom and technical experience. So I'd like to welcome Catherine. Well, good morning, and um, again, uh, Deb Kubza apologizes for her inability to attend this. Um, due to the storm on the East Coast, which I'm sure we all have heard lots about. Um, so aside from her flights being canceled, she did actually manage to drive out of D.C. and get down to Charlotte, uh, but it was still a little bit difficult to get out. And um, aside from that, she's been involved in, um, in her capacity as executive director of the National Health uh, ISAC, involved in a lot of the meetings uh, 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 revolving around the storm and its aftermath. And um, <clears throat> so before I get started on kind of what we're all about, I wanted to kind of talk a little bit about what's going on with the storm and how the ISACs are kind of involved. Um, the ISAC, uh, Information Sharing and Analysis Center, and I'll get into kind of the history of it in a little bit, but there's an ISAC for each of the critical infrastructures. So we're the healthcare ISAC. And um, so our responsibility right now is to kind of work with some of the federal agencies and the state and local agencies and the emergency response system teams to kind of help provide um, all hazard support in the capacity that we can, and that includes kind of finding where um, they're helping get information out to the, the appropriate authorities, as well as finding uh, places uh, that people are unaware of that need assistance. So I just wanted to kind of give you some statistics about, you know, kind of what's happening. I, I know you've all seen the, the, all the damage on the TV screens and, and the newspapers, but, um, you know, as of today, there's still probably over six million people without power. This storm was at times a thousand miles wide and it impacted 21 states along with Ontario, Canada. So, um, you know, the devastation is pretty amazing and you know how bad it, how topsy-turvy this place is was when you see a picture of Obama with uh, Governor Christie uh, uh, with their arms around each other. So, um, so it's a little bit, uh, uh, weird right now out there, and New Jersey, of course, got the uh, the biggest brunt of uh, brunt of everything with the Barrier Islands, which may never recover. And as Christie said, to call it a catastrophe is really an understatement. So you have a lot of stuff going on. 25% um, of the cell towers in downtown Manhattan were down, so a lot of cell service wasn't even, even available in Manhattan. A lot of Manhattan is still dark. You had bus service. You know, the subway systems just now started back up again because of the water issue. But yesterday when they ran the buses, they, you know, in New York, they were like, you know, it's, it's free, right? But the bus system only can handle 2.3 million people and 5.5 million people showed up. So you had buses blowing past bus stops because they just couldn't pick anybody else up. And then you had like the reverse of 9-11 where everybody's coming in from the, over the Brooklyn Bridge, um, walking in just jam packed to get into the city. So it's just been, been crazy. So um, all the ISACs and the, uh, the FEMA and DHS are on constant conference calls providing each other with information because as we saw in Katrina, um, it's very important. Information is hugely important um, to get to all the appropriate teams of people that can help. And there were times in Katrina when people who were watching TV knew more than the emergency teams on the ground, right? So, um, so what we're doing is we're reaching out to uh, hospital associations and some hospitals and trying to get as much information about what they need and ways we can help them as possible. And we relay that on the calls along with the other ISACs. So like you have the transportation ISAC, the energy ISAC, and all those uh, um, other ISACs. So uh, some of the things that are, are uh, a problem right now are um, the pumps. There's a, uh, there are not that many pumps, and the pumps are needed to pump out the substations where the water is so that you can get the new equipment in to get the electricity going, right? So um, pumps are very scarce. So we're trying to, you know, people are trying to figure out where the pumps are needed most. And then you have, of course, the, the backup generators, right? And they need fuel. So you need transportation capability to get the fuel 
to the backup generators. And um, there was a, an example that a um, data, cent data center server provider that um, provides serves websites all over the world uh, they are on generator service, and um, their generators are on the 17th floor. So they have um, their employees carrying buckets of uh, three-gallon buckets of diesel fuel up 17 flights of stairs to keep the generator pumping so that the, um, the websites stay on. So it's just, so now you have a stairwell that's got sloshed diesel fuel all up and down it, and it's just, you know, it's just a big mess out there. Um, so uh, from a healthcare perspective, um, right now there are about um, 55 hospitals that are running, still running on generators. And some of those are going to become um, unstable. So they'll have to start evacuating those hospitals. And we all, I think everybody here knows about the NYU hospital evacuation that was probably the first one that took place. Um, you've probably heard different stories. I heard that the generator had never been tested. But then you talk to people there, and they said, no, it was tested. It just wasn't stable. So I don't think we're going to really know the true story until everything is, is the dust is settled. But that was the first one they got evacuated, and that took a while because you had to walk everybody down the stairs. You had nurses pumping oxygen into people as they're walking down the stairs. And um, miraculously, nobody, uh, nobody died. Uh, and then Bellevue started evacuating yesterday. They had over 500 um, patients. That takes two days. So they're still doing it. And there are supposedly five more hospitals that may have to uh, start evacuating today, too. So it's just been a tremendous... Uh, tremendous issue. Um, if there's one bright spot, it is that this is kind of the first time the ISACs have been really disinvolved in a disaster and able to help. And that's because um, uh, we've uh, come pretty far along in the past 12 years since we, we, uh, we began. The first ISAC was created. So now I'm going to uh, get into our presentation, which I found out late yesterday I was going to be giving this. So if you, this is my first time at this presentation, so bear with me. Um, feel free to jump in and ask questions, and um, I can probably answer most of them, just probably not the acronyms, because there's quite a few of them, because we deal with the government. Um, and then I'm going to, uh, do I just press the, uh, the button here? Okay. Ah, okay. So again, we're the National Health <coughs> ISAC, uh, Information Sharing and Analysis Center. So what that means is basically we're private sector led. We don't get any government funding. We work with the government. We don't get funded by them. Um, there, we're one of about 18 ISACs right now. Um, we're based in the Kennedy uh, Center, Space Center, Florida. And I'm the COO, and I'm based out here in uh, San Diego, California, which is why I could just drive up today and make it. <coughs> but not government funded, OK. So um, this talks a little bit about, you know, the presidential directive that kind of um, goes into sort of the, the, the core responsibilities around critical infrastructure protection. And this is kind of a, a lot of the basis of, of which we, uh, we focus. So there's four or five of them, prevention, protection, uh, mitigation, response, and recovery. And this came out um, last year. Obama uh, published this. And this really kind of um, put a lot of impetus and, and the momentum behind the ISACs. Um, so uh, that was the latest uh, directive. Uh, there have been many more uh, in between, but this was probably one of, us, one of the most su substantive. So um, the ISACs were created um, about 12 years ago um, under another presidential directive. Um, the idea is that over 80% of our nation's critical infrastructure is privately owned. So it's really going to be up to the private industry to uh, protect its, its infrastructure. But it needs to be done in collaboration with, with the government. So ISACs were born. The first ISAC that was developed was the Financial uh, Services ISAC, FS ISAC. Um, so that's about 12 years old now, and they have about 4,000 members. Um, I think there are over 18 ISACs now, um, and I'll show you some of them uh, in a few more slides. But um, there's a sector-specific agency that kind of works with each of the with each of the ISACs. In our case, it's Health and Human Services. Um, so, you know, the Energy ISAC would be Department of Energy, uh, Financial would be Department of Treasury. 
Uh, so again, it's a collaborative approach. It's all about sharing information, developing best practices, and kind of um, developing ways to protect our infrastructure. Um, so this is the uh, National Infrastructure Protection Plan, NIP. Um, again, the government does like, like acronyms. So uh, the NIP was the National Protection Plan uh, that was developed, and this is kind of provides the framework from which we kind of operate. Um, there is a sector-specific plan for each of the uh, sectors. So here's some of them. Um, and this is kind of what each of the sectors uh, work with specifically. And there, that coordinates with the NIP. So I don't know how many of these she has in here. I'll just keep <laughs> pressing. Okay. There. So uh, there are two councils that, uh, that go with uh, what we do. Uh, we're more the operational tactical kind of arm, the ISACs are, but there are two coordinating councils that are part of the critical infrastructure for each sector. The first is the Government Coordinating Council, which is composed of, uh, in our case, healthcare-related agencies that meet uh, monthly, and their focus is on, you know, preparing for, responding, and recovering from, from incidents. Um, the other one is the uh, Sector Coordinating Council, and that's the Coordinating Council that actually identifies and formally identifies the ISAC that they're going to work with. So there's one formally recognized ISAC for each sector. They, um, they also meet monthly. They're uh, composed of the private sector. And then, of course, they work and coordinate efforts and meet periodic, uh, periodically with the Government Coordinating Council. So everything's all in sync. Everybody knows what everybody's doing. So then we get into um, kind of what were defined, and uh, ISACs are, again, privately led, sector-specific organizations aimed at advancing physical and cybersecurity, and that's important because a lot of what we're doing now with the storm is kind of, kind of an all-hazards approach to helping uh, with the disaster recovery. Um, so we're aimed at establishing and maintaining uh, collaborative frameworks for operational interaction between and among members and external partners. So. Um, as again, we're sort of tactical operational arm, we're nationally recognized. So these are some of the existing ISACs here. And they vary in size and they vary in um, uh, robustness, I guess. So you have financial services ISAC, which is considered kind of the Cadillac ISAC because they've been around so long and they've got thousands of members, right? Um, then. You even have the little one, like the real estate ISAC, because you need to protect that too, I guess, right? Um, but then you have transportation and utility and chemical and, and supply chain, some very important ISACs. Um, and they're, again, they're all nonprofit and they're membership driven. There is, um, there are two ISACs that are uh, government related, and that's the emergency management system ISAC and the multi-state ISAC. So those are, do have government involvement. So this kind of wraps up kind of how the collaboration uh, approach, the collaborative approach uh, to the whole uh, information sharing concept. You have here the private sector, the, the, the stakeholders, and then the ISACs. Using the NIP uh, as a kind of a framework, we collaborate, and then we go uh, into the, our sector-specific agencies, work with the coordinating council, and then, of course, the sector Coordinating Council then recognizes us as ISAC, so it's all one big happy family, theoretically. So then, one agency that kind of works across all the ISACs is the Homeland Security, uh, uh, for obvious reasons. So we work with a lot of different agencies within Homeland Security. Some of the, the main ones, of course, are the U.S. CERT, and then what's called the the NKIC, which fortunately is spelled out here because I wouldn't have been able to tell you what it stood for. But it's the National Cybersecurity and Communications Integration Center. And that is um, relatively new. It's about three years old. It's probably in a room a little bigger than this, just outside of D.C. And it has every federal agency represented in that room, and it has seats for all the ISACs, too. 
and that is it's floor to ceiling, uh, you know, TV screens and everything, and it monitors all the attacks going on around the world, and um, helps to mitigate the risk and kind of improve uh, proactiveness and, and decrease reaction time by allowing uh, the flow of information across agencies and amongst the ISACs. So it's, it's a very impressive room. I, I, I got a tour of it about a year ago. It's all top secret. You have to have top secret clearance to get in there, which I, of course, didn't. So it took them about 10 minutes to downgrade it to my level. And so uh, what they showed us around is very impressive. Uh, just to see, you know, it's impressive. And then it's also kind of depressing, too, because you see there's so many attacks going on uh, constantly and where they're coming from and where they're hitting. It's uh, really a phenomenal. Uh, thing. Um, and then U.S. CERT we also work with, and this is their website, um, and you see some of the security organizations that they kind of work with and partner with. And if you click on the National uh, Council of ISACs, you'll see some of the ISACs, including ours, that will take you to our, our website. So we work very closely with Homeland Security. And in order to get a seat uh, in that NCIC as an ISAC, um, you uh, have to ha sign a very hefty document. It's called a CRADA. I don't know what it stands for, but it's CRADA, and it's a very thick document that talks about how that information sharing is going, information sharing is going to occur, because a lot of the information that the government gets is top secret, and it has to be filtered out appropriately so that, that things don't get out that aren't supposed to get out. And if you've been following some of the legislation <coughs> uh, that's they're trying to pass on the Hill. A lot of that has to do with uh, allowing the government to share more information out to the private industry um, to help the industry protect itself. And that's a very important thing. Um, so there are different bills that have been you know, bandied about. None of them have passed. But uh, hopefully, maybe in a year or two, something's going to pass that will help. And that will help the ISACs uh, provide more information to their members. Um, <clears throat> So this just talks a little bit about roles, responsibilities. Again, we uh, help with awareness, interdependencies. We help form partnerships. Uh, we help share information. I'll talk a little bit more about some of the two-way information sharing that we're involved in. And then we help manage risk. A lot of it is uh, cyber awareness and education, uh, just basic cyber awareness. And I'm sure a lot of you out there in the healthcare industry know that uh, you're only as strong as your weakest link. And in the healthcare industry, that tends to be the doctor's offices, which uh, are being dragged mostly kicking and screaming into the EHR world. And they're not happy about it. Their focus, they feel, should be on patients. And dealing with all this other stuff is really annoying to them. So uh, we have to kind of create an awareness and provide them with some basic tools to make it as easy and as possible so we don't um, upset them. Um, I'm sure many of you know a lot of doctors uh, who run physician practices. Uh, I've talked to some who are just saying, I'm just not going into EHR. I'm just going to shut down my practice and we retire. You know, so it's, it's a real bone of contention. And then there's a lot of vendors out there that are coming in promising things that they can't deliver. So one of the things we're trying to do is to help them. So um, now I'm going to get into kind of what we specifically do as the NHI SAC. Um, so our mission is we're going to be we want to be the trusted you know all hazards cybersecurity um, monitoring uh, center. Uh, we're again sector specific, but we do a lot of cross sector um, collaboration. We there's a national council of ISACs that meets regularly, so everybody knows what the other ISACs are doing, and we uh, partner with them on a lot of different efforts. Because as you know, and as seen as in this catastrophe, everything's linked together, right? You know, the transportation is, is linked to your ability to get the oil uh, to the uh, appropriate hospitals, right? Um, <clears throat> so we do early warnings and notifications, which I'll talk a little about, bit about in a second. Um, help with incident response and um, just basically fostering the availability of proven security, governance, awareness, and education. So we're based in, as I mentioned, in Kennedy Space Center, Florida. We also have a base here in San Diego. And Lori is there. Wave your hand, Lori. She uh, works with me out here in San Diego. So I moved out here in January from the East Coast, just in time. 
out of DC to kind of uh, stand up the uh, operations on the West Coast because uh, there's a lot going on out here and um, a lot of uh, uh, members that we can work with to kind of advance things. And some of our leadership board is here today and they'll be speaking on the panel. Emmett McGrath from Westco and Tom McGrath, uh, sorry, and Tom August from Sharp. And uh, John Sapp was supposed to be here from McKesson, but uh, he got stranded as well on the East Coast. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, so this, again, is some of our, this is our leadership board membership. Um, and then we have general members too, but we have a very strong membership uh, leadership board. We're very proud of them and they're very active and engaged. So some of our capabilities, again, trusted entity. We work with uh, government on policy. We tend not to get into policy, but we do work with them, especially with the sector coordinating council. Um, and we work with HHS too. Uh, we provide secure operations 24-7. Uh, uh, security intelligence that's out of our uh, Kennedy Space Center, uh, Florida uh, Center, which is, by the way, uh, located on site at NASA in this Space Lab Science Center, where they do all the tests uh, that, that uh, mimic what's going on up in, in the uh, space, in the moon, Mars. Anyway, uh, so we're sitting there with them and um, running that, and then we're, we have a redundant uh, center out here in San Diego. Um, again, we do two-way information sharing, cross-sector analysis, and incident response. We provide early notification. Um, we've also been involved in cybersecurity exercises. Um, we finished in May uh, a tabletop exercise specific for hospitals. We, our hospital members helped put it together, and we, and we uh, uh, handed out. It's free to anybody that wants it, and it helps the hospitals develop uh, tabletop exercises to help uh, you know, in case of a disaster or, or an attack. So if any of you want that, I'm happy to send that to you. Um, and then there was the first uh, national level cyber exercise back in, in June, which we, we, along with other ISACs and most of the federal agencies participated in. And that was the first national level cyber exercise ever undertaken. And um, it was several hundred people were involved in that. It was a national level exercise. Um, it was kind of a good news, bad news. It was good that we did it. The bad news is we realized how how vulnerable we are and how far behind really getting our act together in terms of preventing and protecting ourselves from cyber attacks. And um, some of the people, uh, I know the Department of Energy guy came to the first meeting and at the end of the meeting when they went around for comments, he said, you know, I was really excited about this when I came because I thought this is good, this is great, you know, we're gonna start moving forward. And then I realized how how horrible it is. We we're just so, you know, not focused and we're not cohesive and we have so far to go um, in terms of protecting ourselves. One of the suggestions during that meeting was, well, if there's a big cyber attack, we'll just shut down the internet, right? until somebody from the energy department said, well, if you do that, then all our transformers will, will, will start to blow. So, you know, there's all these things that people don't really realize and ramifications. And it's, it's actually very, uh, if you get too deep into it, it gets a little bit scary about how bad it can be. So. Um, one of the things we provide our members is a daily advisory and alert. So every morning we meet with other ISACs on a conference call and with U.S. CERT and other agencies and go over some of the alerts and some of the, the, uh, the vulnerabilities. And then we create, our cyber analyst creates uh, an alert uh, page specific to our sector. So this is the daily alerts that go out every day to our members. And uh, beginning early next year, we will have a mobile capability so that people will be able to uh, get those alerts on their phones. So this is kind of getting into the two-way information sharing that we provide. Um, this is kind of the diagram of how it all works. So <clears throat> it's kind of centers around the Lockheed Martin system and they're one of our leadership board. They have what's called a threat information system, TIS. And that system provides for real-time information sharing in a very secure portal. So if you see an attack happening, you can kind of broadcast it or make comments on it to other members, right? 
And the way TIS was developed was AEP, a utility company, came to Lockheed and asked them to put this together because they wanted a way to communicate with their subsidiaries and, and, and vendors in a protected environment about some of the attacks that they were seeing. So we took that model and Lockheed implemented it for us. And we're actually the first ISAC to have it. So um, our members have access to this. Uh, if they see a threat, they can post it. And I'll, I'll show you kind of a sample of that later. Um, so on the left side, you have all the information uh, where, we, where we gather information from, from our members, um, from internet media, uh, US CERT. So that is, feeds into you know, our security analysts who uh, validate it, uh, verify it, and make it into kind of an actionable kind of data information for our members. And that goes into our uh, export-import management system. And that system allows, uh, well, communicates with TIS, but it also allows uh, our members to have access to that information. And if they have a uh, management system that they want to interconnect with that, they can do that. And that can become two-way information sharing. So we would have access to their information as well if they provide, want to provide it to us, which helps us get more information to our members. And then you have the TIS portal, which is uh, a way for members to communicate real time and then we put, pump, push the information out to the membership community. And so that is something that uh, the TIS uh, system went online for our ISAC back in J June. And um, we're very excited about this system because we think that this can really help with information gathering and uh, with our members uh, being able to see what's out there. So the TIS. Um, is Lockheed system. And this is, um, uh, again, it's a secure, secure portal. And uh, a member can go in and post uh, an attack. Um, and there's, as Tom will probably tell you, there's, and hospitals are getting attacked, like, phenomenally. Um, financial, actually, attacks on financial institutions are going down and healthcare industry is going up. Because if you think about it, the amount of information in healthcare record is, uh, is significant. You know, you don't just have the personal data, but you often have credit card information, Medicaid, Medicare, all that stuff. So on the street, that, that's worth a lot more than, say, a Social Security card. And they're all also more vulnerable because they're not as far along as the financial sector in terms of the protections. So there's a lot of attacks. Uh, one of our members, uh, UCSD, uh, I talked to uh, the CIO a week ago, and he was telling us that they get thousands of attacks every day. And just about a month ago, they actually had to bring the FBI in on one. So, um, it, and they're coming from all over the, the world. So this allows uh, our members to say, hey, we got this attack. Has anybody else seen it? Does anybody else know anything about it? And then you can kind of get alerts as that, if somebody else posts something on that case, it will be pushed out to you that there's more information that you can take a look at. <clears throat> so, Another initiative, initiative that we actually just, uh, I think the press release just went out today, uh, has to do with the cybersecurity response system. And what that is, is that's like uh, the, uh, the goal there is to establish protocols and uh, develop training for first responders to focus on cybersecurity. So for example, uh, the storm in the Northeast. Uh, as the systems come back online, people still need to kind of pay attention to the cybersecurity component of that uh, because we can be very vulnerable or forget to put up the protections you need as you're coming back online. So the goal of this is to kind of get first responders in all the healthcare industries around the country, identify a person, a volunteer that we can help train and um, develop so that as that happens, if there's a disaster and things start to happen, that we have those people trained so that they can help as, uh, in their area when something happens and things are starting to come back online, help protect from a cybersecurity standpoint uh, the systems. Another initiative has to do with cyber education. Um, as you probably know, the, there's not a lot of um, people coming out of colleges and grad schools right now with cybersecurity education. So you have a lot of um, jobs that are uh, either going unfilled or are not with the right person, right? So uh, NIST, which stands for National Institute for uh, Standards, Standards and Technology, 
Um, Dr. McDuffie developed uh, the NICE initiative, another acronym, the National Initiative for Cyber Education. And that's a basic generic educational framework meant to promote cyber awareness in the K through 12, cyber education in the, um, the post uh, high school, um, post high school, also just workforce training and um, professional development. So the goal there is to just kind of help people uh, understand cyber, cyber security, but also create a pool of uh, workforce pool where people are interested in that as a career, because that's very important. It's not going away. And as people, uh, as Deb likes to say, you don't, you don't outsource cyber security. So it's not something that we're going to be uh, shipping out, the, off the, you know, out of the U.S. to do. So we really have to develop our workforce internally. So we're involved in that, and the way we're involved in that is that we are um, going to take that framework and make it specific to the healthcare industry as a way to promote a workforce that is not just cyber educated, but also has that ability to apply it directly into a hospital or pharmaceutical company or whatever, so that they're a little bit more prepared for the healthcare industry. So what we're doing is we're having a series of uh, regional workshops around the country to bring in stakeholders in the healthcare industry to help us develop that framework based on that NICE model. We actually had our kickoff in San Diego back in July to kind of get that started, and we had a very good response. So um, we're very excited about doing that. <clears throat> so who can join the ISAC? Anybody involved in the healthcare industry? Again, it's funded 100% by the private industry. Um, and we are, have been focused uh, up until now on the uh, kind of the hospital, the pharmaceutical, the service provider level. But we've just uh, recently done a soft launch of our physician membership model, which is a lot different than the corporate model in that it's focused on, again, cyber awareness and helping them uh, find the right resources to, uh, to protect themselves from not just cyber attacks, but from audits and you know, HIPAA compliance and things like that. And actually, uh, that's one thing that Lori's uh, uh, spearheaded. So we, we've just done a soft launch on that uh, uh, this week, actually. So we're excited about that, too. So these are some of the things we're doing as an ISAC. Um, it's been very busy. Uh, we started out, uh, we've only been around for two years. Uh, we're, so we're one of the newer ISACs. Um, it started out with uh, Deb, me, and, and Josh Singletary at the CTO, and we've grown to over uh, 10 people now. And um, so we have people in Florida, County Space Center, people in San Diego, boots on the ground in, in uh, D.C. And we've aligned ourselves with some universities, University of Illinois, University of Southern Alabama, among others, uh, to kind of work on various projects as well. So we'll have kind of centers there uh, that will be working uh, in terms of doing cyber analysis for the healthcare industry. So um, I hope that kind of uh, explains what we do and what we're all about. Um, and I can take any questions you want, and I'll try to answer them. Yes? Yeah. Excuse me. I'm going to let you have the microphone. Yeah, in fact, all questions, uh, because we're making a recording of this session, everyone can speak into this. And we have two microphones, one on each side. And we have a little extra time, too, right, Despina, for questions and answers than before? Okay. Hi. Hi. I was wondering if you were reaching out also to uh, those in health information regarding um, the people who are doing the records. Yes, absolutely. Like AHIMA and, you know, organizations like yeah, that. Yeah, we, we're starting with the physician uh, doctor's offices, but we realize that, you know, one of the reasons the health care ISAC didn't get started until two years ago is because um, I don't think anybody was stubborn enough other than Deb to really start it because the healthcare industry has so many different facets to it. So it's a little bit like drinking out of a fire hose at times. So um, we do want to get to that. Right now we're kind of starting with the physicians, but we're quickly getting down to that level in terms of the records and everything because that's very important. Absolutely, you're right. Yes. Hey, 
I have two questions. Okay. Uh, we are in the process, we're with Cottage Health System in Santa Barbara, and we are in the process of formulating our incident secure or a security incident response plan. Uh -huh. And uh, so we need to incorporate the evaluation of whether or not ISAC needs to be notified as part of that response to a security incident. Um, how, how do we, what are the circumstances for that or who would we talk to yes, about? Yes, that's a very good question. Well, I, I would be happy to talk to you uh, at the break about that for sure. But uh, we've reached out to every hospital association in the country as a way to kind of start getting down to that level and making hospitals aware of, of us as a, using us as a resource and to let us know when there's an incident. Um, so we all know about the, uh, the wall of shame and the HHS website that talks about anybody who has over 500. Uh, breaches that ha they have to advertise it and all that but what we, isn't known is oh, how much is going on beneath that 500 level and how severe is it and how impactful is it right so we are trying to reach all the hospitals to kind of get our arms around that as well um, one thing that I didn't mention is um, we have developed a survey that we're getting ready to push out to the hospitals to talk about what incidents and it's an anonymous survey um, so when you respond, it's all anonymous, so nobody gets uh, and it has to worry about any reputational damage. But it's how many incidents have you had in the past 12 months, no matter what level they are. Um, you know, what, what were the causes of that incident? What was how how was it fixed? Um, what would you have done differently? And and what kind of disaster recovery plans do you have in place? And how robust do you think they are? So we're we're trying to collect data which will allow us to understand where the hospitals need the most help and also get the word out to use us as a resource so that we can help you when you do have an incident. Thank you. The other question was you mentioned in your remarks earlier that uh, a particular health system was getting attacked frequently. Yes. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? What kinds of attacks and? Oh, it, you know, it was a general conversation and I think it's happening across all major hospitals. Now UCSD, of course, is a major resource research hospital. So they're probably, you know, picked out more likely than, than others. But, uh, you know, they're seeing attacks from all over the world. And, 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 you know, according to him, a lot of it's coming from uh, the Asia countries, China and, and, and Estonia. Um, and they're all different types of attacks that are happening. And what they're trying to get at is the data, right? So that's what the, the, the key is, is getting into uh, everybody hospital's data, patient records, because that provides uh, an enormous amount of uh, bad stuff to happen, right? Um, I told the example of a hospital in New York which um, lost some of its uh, data and they had backup magnetic, magnetic tapes like they were supposed to, but there was something wrong with those tapes. so. That, so they couldn't recover the data. So they had to ship the tapes out to get them recovered, to get them fixed. So they found a vendor that could do it really fast, right? So they, they think they're doing everything the right way. So they, they, the vendor takes care of it, the ship, tapes are shipped back, everything's fine, right? But months go by and a woman comes into the hospital. She's in a car wreck, nothing major, but she goes into, I can never pronounce this word, anaphylactic shock. And her husband comes and says, that's, ridiculous because it was well documented that she was allergic, allergic to, uh, I guess, penicillin, right? So um, they investigated and what had happened was when they shipped these tapes out to the vendor, the vendor didn't do cr criminal background checks. So there was a guy there whose wife was sick. So he picks her medical records out, moves things around, is able to get her um, free health care, right? So that's what caused it. So um, here's a hospital thinking they're doing the right thing, but a patient dies. They have reputational damage in the millions of dollars. Uh, doctors, you know, leave the hospital. They're fined, they're sued, you know, all that stuff. So millions of dollar, dollars later, you know, they're still trying to recover. So it's not just malicious attacks from the outside, but it's just, you know, having business associate agreements that are... Uh, ironclad. It's all these different places where things can go wrong and there are just so many for a hospital, like the bring your own device issue, right? That hospitals are constantly trying to, to get their arms around. And I'm sure Tom August can talk a little bit about that, what he's seen at Sharp Hospital, because it's just, it's an enormous task to kind of keep your head above water even, because so much is changing so fast.
Thanks. Um, I just wanted to add something. Um, I'm Jim Brady. I'm the CISO at Hawaii Health Systems, kind of a little bit over the water. Um, but something that um, Catherine was mentioning, uh, there's, I know at our system, um, there's, you know, we have hundreds of uh, attacks, you know, that were that are hitting the firewall. So if, if you talk to network engineers or the people that are kind of protecting the perimeter, you know, there's port scans that are going on. They're, they're just bad people. There's just, you know, bots out there just looking for a way to get in. Because once you get into a system, then once you're on a system, it's really easy at that point to find a hole to jump onto another system. And as she was saying, there's a lot of there's a lot more value in a in a exposed health health data than there is necessarily in just a social security number. So, uh, although statistically, from uh, I'm with the, I'm also the chair of the HIMSS Mobile Security Work Group, so we do a lot of uh, a lot of work on you know what's going on in the country and what's the hot topics and things. Um, and there's uh, definitely a lot of uh, a lot of activity on the technical side, but typically it's. Uh, most organizations, they have a pretty good firewall, and so most of the time you're not going to, you know, you have to be pretty bad to, you know, have enough open things where people can get through, let's just say, from the outside with these uh, things that are scanning constantly. I think you might also want to be concerned if you're at home and you, you haven't necessarily p enabled a personal firewall. That's probably where you might want to you might want to check uh, on your home system. But you know, typically, health systems are pretty on top of it. But most of the problems are going to come from in, inside, where there's social engineering and uh, you know the, those business associate agreements are really important because once a vendor gets on that system or their they that organization has access, then they can actually hop around. Uh, and there's nothing really you can do unless you ha unless you uh, go through special, very expensive techniques to kind of just keep that system from not being able to see any other system. So most health systems were behind the times. We're not as uh, locked down and as streamlined as the financial industry. So it's a little bit more open, more trusting. And so, um, you know, uh, all things can happen um, uh, not just from the outside, but it's really on the inside. So I just want to kind I, of I add totally that. agree, and I think uh, preaching to the choir with Tom, you know, social engineering, that's a, that's a lot of words happening, right? Right, Tom? It's all about social engineering, and it's just so easy to get in to uh, to access it just by saying, you know, I'm, I'm here to do something, you know, and you've got an honest face, and they just let you on in. And, um, you know, it's, it's that's a real tough tough issue because you're asking everybody to just be incredibly cynical and not trust anybody. You know, that's the other extreme and nobody really wants to go there. So where's that, where's that uh, happy medium going to be where everybody's safe, but you're not forcing people into a situation where they just, you know, you know, frisk their own mother before they let her by, you know? So, uh, uh, so yeah, it's a real, that's definitely a real problem. And, and especially in doctor's offices, I mean, you know, can I tell the story of what you did at your physician office? <laughs> anyway, so you have, you know, you just have a lot of issues that that um, that are going to happen, and the doctor's offices that are hooked into the hospitals are definitely the weakest link, right? Because they are just, I don't want to say oblivious, but they don't see it right as a priority. They just feel like I'm here to fix my patient, and everybody else should just leave me alone, and. Yes, there are audits coming out of OCR and HHS that are kind of making examples of some of these physician offices, but it's going to be a while before the momentum kind of swings towards uh, the doctor's offices and they start to pay attention. So we're just trying to kind of push that along a little faster because I think there's a lot of um, a lot of ways things bad things can happen. So, question here. I'm Richard Greenberg from LA County Public Health. I'm the Information Security Officer. Um, just wanted to point out, you know, the, the information that's being discussed here is really important. But one thing I haven't heard yet: the best firewall in the world opens port 80, which is how we talk to the internet. Once you open port 80, then anything can go back and forth. One thing that you have to be able to do is ac access your applications, and so. 80% of the hacks that are going on today are through applications. So we must vet any application, whether it's customized, whether it's off the shelf, whether it's internally developed. We must have a whole process to test that all through the life cycle. And prior to deploying it, we must do an intense test of that application through vulnerability assessments. If you don't do that, 
you're hacked, whether you know it or not, because it's just too easy. And so we be, have to be very careful about this. Absolutely. Point out. That's a good point. And um, another point, and, and Emmett could probably talk about this, is the physical component of that. As he points out, you can have the best fortress in the world, all the greatest firewalls, and somebody could go along outside your uh, fortress and snip your fiber optic line, and, you know, what good is that, right? And that actually happened down in San Diego. We had actually had, just had lunch with him, and he was talking about that. And that night on the news, they talked about how the Navy's Internet went down because somebody was digging before they called, and they, uh, you know, snipped their line. So, you know, it was kind of funny. Here the Navy's pouring millions of dollars into their security, and, you know, some, some guy, some construction worker, just cut them off, you know. So, so that's another element, too. So, yes. Hello. Um, my name's Larry, and I'm a student. Um, I, I just have a question for everybody. Has anybody heard of a certification called HIT Pro? Could you raise your hand? Oh, thanks. I'm glad to hear that because I just passed it. <laughs> I'm transitioning over from um, the telecommunications industry, and a lot of what you're talking about seems to be what the cable industry went through when they, um, when you're talking about hardening things and coming up with backup generators and just basic risk management, um, risk assessment. But my question to you would be more along the lines of, I just got through studying a whole bunch of different um, healthcare applications that are, you know, we got a new standards committee. Um, we got 200 new people in the field of um, digitizing and uploading records for people into uh, the cloud. And um, where does your organization fit uh, in terms of uh, once they even figure out a place where to put these HL7 compliant files in the cloud? I mean, we don't even know where they're sitting yet, as far as I know in the future. So where does your organization sit in that? So our, our spectrum. Thank you. Yeah. So our, are you asking me where we, what our opinion is, or where we, where, how yeah, we impact and, it? And also, right. um, so uh, you're not a regulatory body. No. So um, your corporate we're governance, like, we're corporate more governance the, would call that maybe. And yeah, then, uh, probably fall under governance, and we're sort of more the uh, the central information sharing uh, center, so that we can kind of take the needs of the industry. Uh, and and to promote them. So that would be one thing that you know we could we would want to help our members with developing. Um, and we do actually have a committee that we're uh, getting ready to kick off on governance, which that would be kind of fall into that. And that's uh, hopefully going to kick off in the next uh, few weeks. Actually, Tom is nodding his head because he's the one who uh, told us we needed to have that. So we're doing it. So and he's going to be running it for us, right? <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> so, awesome. It's it's great to hear some of these questions that really get at the heart of some of the issues that we face, and that is the non-technical solutions to problems that we see as technology issues, but they're they're related or they're rooted in governance and process. We have a panel that's going to talk about that a little bit later today in detail, um, which is really cool. But I also want to get back to one other point that was raised, and that is. The challenge we face in healthcare, specifically in healthcare, which we're, we're trained to have a culture of compassion. We're, we're trained to have a culture of helping others. And social engineers love that because that's what they love people who help others. So security awareness becomes this really difficult problem. I know we're faced with that challenge at Sharp in that I have a culture that's so positive and so friendly. Yet I have to train people that not everybody's friendly and some people are really out to get us. And that's a real challenge. So I think that's, that's something we all face. But I, I really uh, just wanted to kind of raise that point. There's really a, a, almost an uh, ironic kind of match between that. The very thing that we're proud of is the very thing that could uh, get exploited. So it's really, really hard for us to kind of find that balance. Yeah, exactly. That's the, that's the tough part. Exactly, yes. Um, anything else? Well, thank you very much. And again, Deborah sends her apologies for not showing up. So, thanks. <laughs>